going to start. We this we are happy to welcome everybody. Since we are starting a new season of coming to the library again, um, the library has asked us to have the program first, and then following the program will be our society's business meeting. So um, that's why there's a little change in what we used to do in the past to come to our group sessions before the pandemic. Well, well, I want to welcome all of you to this meeting on the September 16th. And I'm secretary of the Historical Society. My name is Pat Annarella. And I'm so glad to welcome all of you tonight. I have a few housekeeping things to go over. I need to remind you to please mute your cell phones and any devices. And if you didn't sign in to the registration table, uh, please do so before you leave. It's, the registration table is over here, and there's a clipboard that if you could sign your name and put in your email. There's a reason for if this pandemic continues and we have to do Zoom meetings, we will need your emails. And if you're not currently a member of the, this, our society, we invite you to join us. Our membership dues are only $15 per household per year. But you're going to find later at the business meeting that it's going to be this $15 will carry over through 2022. Now, some members of our society would appreciate it if you would wear a mask. It's not mandatory, however, but thank you. We have some new masks on the table if you need one. Today, it's my honor to do, introduce our speaker, whom I'm sure you all know, Ron Buckley and his wife, Pat, who are sitting behind me. Ron and Pat are members of our society, and Ron is on our library board. As you know, he's an amateur archaeologist. You will find many of his publications in the local history department of our library downstairs. I counted 17 on the shelf yesterday. I brought up two of those publications today. One of these is titled Terrell Ash Site Harris 2018. So that matches what he's going to be speaking on tonight. And then another book is called G.W. Terrell 2019. Now these books are part of the reference collection. Um, so that means they will be on the shelf in the local history department. You'll also see Ron and his family, Pat and some of the children and grandchildren, on the many Boone County local history YouTube videos. How many have looked at our YouTube videos on local history? Anybody? Good, some of you have. Okay, to find these videos, you need to go to the library website. It's www.bcpl.org. And then you would scroll down that page to the bottom left, and you'll find a place to type in a search, and it's under Boone County Historical Society Lectures. And then you type, if you want Ron's material, you type in his name, Ron Buckley. Okay. On his various digs, Ron has found many unusual artifacts. And he's brought some to share with you tonight. At the end of his presentation, you, you may want to come up and look at what's on the table here. He's also given a doorknob that's mounted, mounted on a wood display, and it's in the local history area downstairs. And please welcome Ron Buckley and his wife. And uh, I'm going to turn this microphone over to him. Well, it's good seeing you all again. We've made it so far. I don't recognize some of you because you've covered up half your face, but that's all right. <laughs> Um, by chance is a Charlie Ash here. Okay, he didn't know 
he would be able to come or not. This is the gentleman that uh, let me work on his land. Uh, I have basically found that most of the uh, people who own land around here are more than happy and will trust you to work on their land. Uh, I know Janine Kreinberg is here. Where's she hiding? There you are. Uh, just a small comment there. She, uh, years ago, filled out something called a National Register of Historical Places. This is uh, the site that I'm working on this year, and it's the Chrysler uh, Grist Mill. Uh, this is my 11th year. It will be my last. Uh, basically, my surgeon has decided that after three back operations, it's time to stop. So I will be stopping. Janine, thank you. What you put out in this document gave me a foothold to get going. And the work that you did is extremely professional, by the way, and very thorough. Thank you very much. So today we're going to talk about the Terrell Ash uh, program. Uh, before I get into that, people always ask, why do you do this historical? Why do you go out with all mosquitoes and poison ivy? And I don't know. Uh, as Pat Wingo said, May 5th, 2016, we can't, we can't prevent the loss of every historical building, grave marker, cemetery, or archaeological site. But we can work to document the remaining evidence of our history so that the end, if the inconceivable does happen, we have done our best to preserve and record the memory for future generations. This is exactly why at the age of uh, ooh, 78, I go out up and down the hills in the heat, the rain, the mosquitoes. Hopefully it will be useful to someone in the future uh, when most of our historical sites have been torn down, turned under by progress and time. And who knows, maybe some young person will look at some of the books in the Boone County Library and go on to a fabulous and rewarding career in either history or archaeology. Next. Uh, the first... Uh, the first one here, this is the George Terrell House. It was built by 1859. It's on the National Register of Historical Houses. Uh, the properties I have worked so far are Robert Pyatt, Jacob Pyatt, Absalom Graves, Terrell, and now the Chrysler. I am not an historian or archaeologist. I'm an amateur. I have had uh, been on uh, digs with Penn State University down in Mexico, but that was years ago. Next. Here's the wonderful barn that's near that house. The house is beautiful. The barn looks like if you went near it and you blew an air at it, it would fall right down. It, you can see it's about seven stories high. It's really in bad shape. Next. Let's look at the uh, Terrell genealogy. You have the elder John Terrell, his son John Terrell Jr., and George W. Terrell, which is John uh, Terrell Jr.'s son. Uh, John Terrell was born in 1768 in Culpeper, Virginia. Uh, he married uh, a Rebecca Cornelis and had a whole bunch of kids. He came to Boone County in 1804. He served in 1812 under Captain Sanford. In 1818, he became a member of the board of the Pittsburgh uh, Steam Mill Company, which later became Pittsburgh Distillery. He died in 1849. Uh, he willed his property to George Washington Terrell, uh, which is 400 acres. Then you have John Terrell, his son. He married Elizabeth Graves. We've heard the name Graves before. That was the absolute Graves site our Absalom Graves uh, farm that we discussed about three years ago. This was uh, uh, the Graves' daughter of Absalom Graves that he married. But she died six months later. He then married uh, Nancy Walton from Bracken County in 1825, and they had a large farm in Pittsburgh. They had about nine children. Most of the children did not live. George did, however. He was born in 1828. He died in 1894. He married Amanda Walton in 1847 and died in 1848. Uh, he was a captain in the Civil War under uh, John Morgan. He was very sick. His father paid $5,000 to get him relief. 
released out. He was also a state senator from 1869 to 1870. Next. Uh, George and Robert Terrell. The Piats uh, in 1800 uh, got their first license for a ferry across the river. Uh, they had it until 1865 when they, when they sold it to George and Robert Terrell. Uh, the ferry landing went on through different people. Uh, the last person to uh, live there uh, was 1957. Uh, the ferry itself, though, we have a good idea how long it ran. Uh, Steve Conrad, didn't you say that uh, you used to take that ferry across in the 1940s? Yes, it was so a large it ferry. Long. Yeah. So that ferry ran for about 150 years. That last person that lived at that ferry house there was a Don McGuire, very fine person. Thanks. Here's an 1883 map. It shows you some very interesting things. You can see the GW Trail up here, coming on over. You come on down here, he's over here, here. And on this side, he had a tremendous amount of land. This is an overlay. Uh, I have approximately 60 people that I work with who help me in different parts of my uh, work. Uh, this one was a fellow in Florida. You can see the contour map underneath and the 1883 map on top. And that yellow dot there, that's the site we're looking at right there. You can see it's close to the river. That's very important. Here is a map of the whole area. The yellow part up here is the Absalom Graves. He got his land in 1802. Jacob Pye, uh, he has all of this right here. There's like 31 sites there. And you can see he bought along the river too. Over here, you see Robert Pyatt. You see Robert Pyatt. He bought along the river. These were very smart individuals. And Robert Pyatt, he goes much further up there than you think. There were approximately 12 families living there uh, that I found information on. So George Terrell bought this land that we're looking at in 1888 for $1,088. He, if you look at the left side, the writing on it there, uh, at a different angle, it's where they put the promissory note. He only put down $88. That's all he put down. Uh, you look at the next sheet there, and you can find very uh, rewarding information, like it says, uh, it's along the Lawrenceburg Ferry Road. Another part says it's on the east side. It talks about a house there. So this gives you quite a bit of information. To go back and check these, uh, as Janine would say, it takes a lot of time, an awful lot. I think I spent 40 hours just checking it back to this area. Thank you. So there's the site we're looking at. I want you to notice that most of the main buildings are on this flat level here. He does have uh, some different sheds in different areas. One and two and four are very, very important. Uh, something that I was able to do that they couldn't do in the 1960s when uh, all of our uh, people were going around finding uh, log cabins and that. There wasn't a GPS system. So it was really hard to even begin to try and record all these sites. But these are all GPS reads. Uh, 
that means if you put that into a GPS machine, you're going to be within three to four feet. I'll give you an example. I took a friend out uh, two weeks ago. We were trying to find this. After 45 minutes, I gave up. It had grown up so much, the road had grown up, the area had grown up, sticker bushes, you name it. We could not find it. I will take it back with my GPS and be able to find it. These GPSs are really needed. Uh, every book, every site that I've ever worked has a GPS reading. So here, we're going to show you about four or five uh, different uh, shots. These are aerial photos. Uh, I had some friends out at uh, Salt Lake uh, who were with the government were able to help me get these. I told you one and two are important. One and two are not on the 1883 map as a structure. I don't, I guess that's because there was no building there. Even though this thing was built to the bank, it's the only thing I can figure. You can see that it looks empty, no structure. But look at all the others. Big barn up there. That's what these aerial shots will do for you. Next. Uh, here's a road that's no longer in existence. This was the old road to come into this area. It is completely grown over and gone. You now come in from this area. If you go down this road, you get into the back part. Uh, back part of uh, uh, Mr. Ash's property, and what do you find up in here? You find there's a, a building that was uh, uh, Terrell. It's got a chimney that's partially up. But you've got to really, you got to have a four-wheeler, you can't even get there. And it's landlocked. The owner does not have a direct entrance. Uh, here it is in 1949. In 49, you can still see the old road. And you can still see that area right there has nothing there. There are two buildings to the right, but there's nothing there. Next. And then in 1954, you see all, you see the road is still there, but it's starting to diminish. And you see all the sites are still there. Next. But you get into 1960, a couple of them are gone. Next. 1975, there's only five sites left. All the rest of the buildings, the lumber has been taken out are, and they have fallen down. Next. So basically, I just set up a little chart to see what was happening. And you can see that as far as structures are there and that, the heyday was in the 50s and the 60s, and then it went downhill. And the property really wasn't used for much after that. It has basically sat there. Give me a second to call it up here. Okay. Next. So, if you want to have a good day, here's a place to go. You might have to cut your way through it. Uh, that's typical of what I worked in down there. And here's the main part of the site. You've got this structure over here uh, that's about 30 feet long, 20 foot wide another little one about 12 by 12 here. Then you have this gigantic stone wall that comes over and in places it's about eight foot tall and we accidentally uncovered this part right here. But first this is the uh, beehive furnace right here and it's all made with the same stone as what you see along the wall. This stone is a little bit different. So we accidentally uncovered this and we realized from what we saw there that there may have been a structure on the outside of this. And then there's uh, like a platform here and here of uh, stones that people could have worked at. And here's a hole in the top of it. 
Now there's other parts to this. So this was used to create heat and make something. Here's a later version that I'm guessing is right around 1940, 1950. It's another structure, about 30 long and 15 or 16 wide. Uh, the interesting thing is they had cement steps going over here, and there was a path, and then we uncovered the sidewalk. And the sidewalk went all the way up to this well up here, well number one. Uh, it's important, it had uh, a completely metal lining to it, and they must have really needed that water for whatever they were doing down here. There's nothing down here to show me what they used it for, except uh, some bricks that melted. I know they created a lot of heat there. So this is just a close-up for you to see. Here's where the beehive is, right down here. But this is a, this is a beautiful structure. Beehive furnaces are not supposed to be up there. <coughs> Louis, I think I read Louisville and Lexington area down in there, they used to have some. Thanks. This is beautiful. If you ever get a chance to go see it. I call it sky stairs. There's three steps here that they use to go up out of this area. Because you gotta remember, this is a very long wall. Each one of those steps had to weigh at least 300 pounds. You can walk up to them, walk up to them uh, to this day, and they don't even move. They're absolutely beautiful. And then over here, you're getting into your beehive furnace. Next. Uh, here's a picture of it. I'll be showing you another, but I want you to see how all this fits together. Here's the steps. Here's the entrance to the beehive furnace. You notice something else. There's stone here. This side has a little bit of cement on it. And we'll go into that. Uh, you see some stakes there that we used after we cleaned it out. It took my grandson, my granddaughter, myself, my wife, Buster Craddock's son, 30 days to get the honeysuckle and everything out of there. It was a real mess. So from there we started working the area. Next. Uh, this is December uh, 2018. I took my grandson there. Uh, we did not go in because I did not know how safe it was. And somebody told me there was cotton miles up here. So I was a little bit leery. Next. Here's some of the things that were found there. Here's a hammer. Hinge, canning lid, coal. I did not find one axe on that property. Just tons of coal. Next. Here's some other things that were found there. Hinge, lock, and a little hook device there. Next. These two are rare. This is like a wood splitter. This thing here, I had no idea what it was. There's a gentleman, I think his name is James Duvall, I'm not sure, James that works in the courthouse. He was an excellent source of information. He said, I don't know what that is, it's a fro. I said, what's a fro? I never heard of it. He said, that's what they use to make shingles. They cut, you have a log there, you put it on top, and this was just razor sharp. You pound it down, and it made it split the little shingles for you. So. An interesting thing that goes with this, there's no other structures around. There wasn't anybody else living around there. So they must have used them to try and uh, cover their own house. From what I can see, it's only possible use. Next. Here's some things that were found there. Uh, different boats, a horseshoe, other pieces of metal. Next. Uh, we found a track there. Shows you what they were doing. There's a nice big lock. Keep going. Uh, this was interesting. I was doing some metal detecting. Uh, oh, geez, what's this? It's a pipe. One pipe. There were two of them put together. It was the barrel of a shotgun. No other part of it was there. Just that. Next. 
Uh, here's some other things that were found. The top there is part of a watch. We found two or three knives. And here's a little brass button that had a bird on it. Very small. That's it. Here's my granddaughter working. Uh, she found a thimble. These things are important. It gives you an idea of who lived there and what they did. That's it. Here's my grandson. You can see he found a real big knife there. That's it. I don't know what this is. I've tried to figure it out. It says on it, uh, J. H. Fenton, and it says security down here. It's about uh, two inches across. Anybody got any ideas? I had to give up. I couldn't think of it. Looks like part of a lock. Part of a what? A lock. A lock. A lock. Oh. Thank you. Right here. Yeah. Yeah, I've been trying to figure it out for two years. Next. These are, I think, some of the burner uh, lids on the cast iron stoves. Uh, here again, what do you find? You find pieces of uh, coal and charcoal on them. Uh, there's quite a few of them on the site, but no accident. Next. These still confuse me to this day. My grandfather had something like this in the 1940s and early 50s that were used to help the windows go up and down. But first of all, there was only one building there. And second, they're all different sizes. And third, this one says VI and it just happened to weigh six pounds. So I, I really can't say what they were used for if they weren't used for weights or for a window. The only ones I'd ever seen previous, which was 67 years ago, were for windows. I don't know. Uh, here's some other things we find. We found a big horseshoe, uh, decorative brass big piece here. These are always nice to find, little objects. Uh, a metal spindle, and this thing is a piece of metal that was curved. I don't know what that was for. People that metal detect want to find what's called a honey hole. That's where you've got a whole bunch of metal. Uh, there's people up in the Michigan area that uh, find these with uh, 10, 15 silver ornaments that Indians made. That's so here's everything that's found there. I mean, I got tired of digging. Uh, I just kept finding one piece after another. You've got latches, you've got horseshoes. Uh, a lot of miscellaneous metal, old barge spike, all sorts of things. Thanks. So, here's your beehive furnace. I wish you would have been with me. I could have used your help. <laughs> so, after a month, we had it cleaned out. The only problem is you cut honeysuckle, and guess what happens? You know, like four or five pieces come up. Next. Uh, this is my son. Uh, Tim, he's a structural engineer, so I had to come down and look at it before I even go into it. Uh, because the top uh, had a crack in one of the support rocks. I don't know who that is. <laughs> Some woman came walking by and asked him if she could carry branches. <laughs> yeah, that's her. So, we're cutting all this stuff out to get it out of our way, and we find a place to put it. I get an aerial photographer in that bin, and guess what? Where we put it, there's another site. So here's this huge mound of this stuff. So here's a good series of drawings on your beehive furnace. Here's your wall, here's your pads, here's the, uh, here's the uh, beehive itself, here's the cross section of it. Let's look at a modern version. Go ahead. There's a more, more uh, accurate thing of a modern uh, type of a beehive furnace. They may call it something else. Next. And here's what it looks like. I know we looked at the picture like this before, but I want you to see something. I hope you can see it. This is V-shaped. 
It looks square on the outside, but you start walking into it, and it's a V-shape. And the reason for that is so that they can plug it up and keep the heat in there. And you cannot walk through it right away. You've got to go through it sideways. Just hope it doesn't fall in. It's, it's pretty safe. Next. Um, so here's some of the things we were talking about. First, this is a hole in the top of it to really smoke and everything. Over here, you see the cement that somebody has put on the outside. And yet you still have stone over there. This is what it looked like, that uh, little 12 by 12 area I was talking about. All that had to be cleared out. Next. The site starts becoming strange. Here's the inside of it. The stones are in there good. They seem strong. I didn't see any wobbling, didn't feel any wobbling. It's still a good structure. Uh, next. This is tremendous. When they built this, somebody put this ledge around. It goes around the whole inside of the building. You can actually sit on it, it won't cave in. But then you start looking around. You say, gee, somebody put some type of cement or something around here. And then you look further and you say, gosh, there's white paint on there. And then you look at the floor, same thing. Somebody put some cement on the floor, light, not real heavy, painted white. The whole thing was painted white. So then it gets more mysterious. What's going on here? So there's the way it looks towards the roof. The stones actually slant in a little bit. They got to a certain height. I don't know if they caved in in the past or what, but the top is cement. Well, there's snakes, there's snakes. <laughs> I have to find out what's underneath. I have to have some idea of what was going on here. And the floor was all cracked, chunks laying around, filled with water. You can see I was getting a little dirty. And I had to pull out a rock. But before we look at that, here's the walls. They more or less look like they have iron drippings going down. Uh, spoke to a Leon Williams at, see, he's at Redland Bricks. He has five decades of experience in these type of uh, kilns and that. And he said that when things are heated up, the little iron pellets or whatever shoot out. So here's what was underneath that 125 pound piece I pulled out. You have pieces of coal, pieces of charcoal. They tell me that somebody was using the base of that thing uh, to put their fuel in to heat it up. Still doesn't answer the question as to what was actually going on. So the next two or three pages are from uh, Leon Williams and James Frederick. Uh, he's head of the, uh, the Brick Association uh, at Clemson, Clemson University. And many different things were thought. Uh, the first thoughts were it was probably used to make jugs and pottery. And then maybe put uh, some moonshine in. You're right there at the river, so right over Cincinnati, and make some money. Uh, other thoughts they were thinking that uh, it was a very unusual style of uh, uh, furnace to have, but maybe it was used for making pig iron. Well, there's nothing around there to show me it was pig iron. Absolutely nothing. I've worked with another pig iron furnace before. There's just nothing there.
So I had to I had to come to some type of conclusion. So I figured there there could have been three different things going on there. Doesn't mean it's right, but it's all I can come up with. I think there was a kiln there for pottery. I think they probably did have all well as making regular type jugs. Because of the paint and everything involved in there, that wasn't just to burn things. I, I really think somewhere between 1850 and 1870 they may have had uh, some type of meetings there. I know Masons were around in the area. I know there were slaves around uh, trying to get over to Ohio and that. I can't come up with a final answer. I just don't know. But then later on, 1860s, 70s, they probably converted it on over to uh, farmland. So I think it probably has at least three lives to it. Uh, we were talking about that well, the uh, metal inside. Uh, here's a uh, picture of it. And if you look down in there, you can see it's all metal. That's, uh, that's just a picture of the size of the well. That's Here's some of the things that were found around it. Uh, I don't know if that's a transformer or what is that electrical thing there. I'm not familiar with electricity. A knife and then some type of grape cover or something. That's uh, down there is a bunch of red, a red mass of something. Those are bricks. We're getting into the retort oven that I talked about earlier. Speaking with those two gentlemen, they said it took 1,500 to 2,000 degrees to melt bricks like that. You just don't melt them easy. So looking at that site, uh, let's see a picture on that. Uh, it has uh, some rock foundation below it, but then they've got concrete blocks on the top too. Uh, it's about 30 by 15. It's got like Two areas here are kilns that heat up things. This, I cannot figure out what, what they were making there. There was nothing there, nothing at all, no matter how hard I look. Next. So here's the, some of the stones down in here below, and then it had some cement on top, a very thin layer. Next. Uh, this isn't a good picture. Show you better. Next. Uh, this is some type of valve I saw there. Uh, you can see some charcoal type stuff there, coal. Next. These are two bricks that were called Number One Savage, so you can use this type of information to find out the history of everything and get hopes that people might know, like this Leon Williams. Next. So here's a good, fairly good picture of it. You've got like blocks here, and you've got bricks in the center, and that's uh, used to get a high heat and get rid of the impurities. And that sort of talk, that sort of uh, coincides in with that walkway and the well that was there. Uh, whatever they were doing, they had to have good pure water and everything to go from there. And here's a modern day version of it. same type of setup, but more in there. So here's some of the things that were found there. A lock, a doorknob, miscellaneous piece of metal. Next. Here's some other things. Here's part of a, some cabinet piece or something and other pieces of metal. Next. Uh, about six feet from there, no, about 12. 12 feet from there, uh, there was like an open pit. Next. Uh, also, on this large metal cabinet there with what's inside. I do not know what that was for. I have seen things like this uh, used to help stabilize a building or a corn crib or anything else like that. This is that valve type thing. These were tubes. So I think somebody was using something to heat it up. I don't know. Was it maybe propane or something. I don't know. Uh, this is just another picture of the uh, pit next door there. Next. Then we go on to another site. There's uh, 
about five or six sites left to go. Most of them uh, are little uh, buildings in that. There's two of them that are weird. This one and another site, you have the roof and everything intact, laying on the ground. The sides are gone. They aren't there. And that's one of the areas I worked in. That's, uh, here's a cement structure that somebody had put in. And I have seen this on other farms uh, to carry water. But here's something weird to me. Why is that pipe there? And it goes all the way through. I don't know, maybe they drained to clean it out or they were making something there. I don't know. Next. Here's some things that were found there. Uh, part of a, a lamp base, uh, a plow shear, and then some other miscellaneous metal. This was really strange. This was one of the walls. Now, before the rain got to it, there were two things on top that looked like horns. And then you have like a goatee down here. So I don't know if somebody threw a man or if he tried to do a devil. I have no idea what was going on. <laughs> Let's just add to the confusion. Next. Anyway, these are some of the things that were found there. A hinge, a saw. Uh, here's a bigger uh, punch type thing, some miscellaneous metal. That's... Here's the other one. It's the same situation. There's no side. They're gone. Uh, if you look real close, you'll see right here, they cut this out so that something could be brought in or driven in or something. Uh, I would guess that 1940s, 50s, somewhere in there. Next. And here it is close up so you can tell what was really cut out. Next. Uh, this, they must have been having some terrible floods at that time. These uh, cement columns, the building evidently rested on, but what's left of it is 10 feet away. They must have been uh, having some really bad uh, water situations. This is the inside, it's just a little sitting there. Next. Uh, this is, I can't pronounce it right, Cate, Cate, Cate uh, This is a little item that's found there that's probably a half inch by three quarters of an inch at most. And I looked it up and uh, they keep pictures in it or hair or whatever. It's a little locket. It's called a propeller design from what I read. This is that big thing down there. It must weigh 20 pounds. Uh, somebody did a pretty fancy job making it. And if you see there's wire here. This thing was probably uh, hooked onto a post and used as a hitching post or something. Next. Here's a uh, brass keyhole plate. Uh, so this place may have been used as sort of a business. Next. Here's some other things that were found there, uh, cutting blades and miscellaneous. Oh, here's a, uh, uh, a hinge, post hinge, I think they call it. Here's some other metal that was found. Now let's have some more fun. Oops, that isn't a long one. This is a great big spike that was found down there. That's on the table. And other metal. Next. Uh, this was a disaster waiting to take it to the hospital. Uh, very steep, muddy, water down at the bottom. There's a garbage dump. But you can see there's pottery and stuff there. So I had to go down. <laughs> I found I couldn't go down walking. I had to slide down on my hind end. And then I found going out was even worse. I had to go on my hands and knees. You gotta remember there's glass and metal down there. You really don't want to get hurt too much. I didn't do too much time down there. Next. Here's some of the things that were found down there. Uh, old stove leg. Uh, this I think said coffee. This is probably 1940 somewhere in there. Next. Oh, there's something I knew if I brought home my wife would not like it. 
a chamber pot. <laughs> Especially since it would leak. I didn't even try and carry it out. No way. You can see the growth that's there at this point, which wasn't there before. It makes it really dangerous. Next. Here's some of that pottery that was down there. I did get those out. Next. Uh, we're going into well number two now, which is site eight. This well was all covered in. And the strange part about it is that it's about 110 feet away from the other structures. And the wells that I've worked with so far aren't that far away. So there's just all sorts of junk that was thrown in there, bricks in there. That's, there's some other pictures of it. There's some handmade bricks down there. That's, so then I start finding things there. There's a copper or brass bell, top and bottom. Here's a little cast iron person, a knife. Here's a lock. So you got to say, what is, what is a lock doing at a well? I think I've come to the thought that there's possibly another structure down there that I don't know. Makes sense for it to be this far away from a house. Next. Well, this is site 10. You're getting into the different structures there for animals and that. Next. You have to clear that out, by the way. Uh, this uh, is a barn that was about 30 by 40 foot. If you look at that rock at the bottom, there is some cement on top layer. Next. Uh, if it wasn't for the aerial photo, I would not have found that because there's so much growth there. The aerial photos really make the difference. Uh, some different farm equipment parts next. Uh, we know it was there in the 70s. Well, there's an electrical outlet or uh, a light, canning lid, some type of little harness decorations down here at the bottom right. Next. A uh, couple of uh, horseshoes and a stirrup. I don't know what that is on the left. Is it some type of grappling claw or used to hoist stuff or what? Next. So let's add more confusion to the site. What is the child slip runner doing there? I don't know. It's near the barn. There's, there's no other place around. There's not a house within a half mile. So that sort of makes you wonder. Uh, down below, I don't know for sure what it is. It looks like it could have been something like a tractor seat, part of a horseshoe nest. Here's some other things that uh, we found there, different uh, parts of the machinery in that, in that barn. So now we get into site 11. These sites were only found by aerial photography, period. Uh, we found some pieces of uh, metal roofing in that there. Next. And a couple of hinges. Next. Then we go on to site 12. Let's see what we found there. Next. Uh, go to the next picture, I think. I know. Yeah. Uh, these are very common on farms. They're used to uh, keep gates uh, uh, shut so the animals don't get through. Next. Here's another one, site 13. Not much at these sites, just little structures at one time or something for the animals. Nice. And there's what was found there, parts of a watch in that. Don't know why that's there. Next. And here's site 14. Next. So there we found uh, just some barbed wire. That was about it. Uh, this is the last site. Uh, that was, I mentioned something about the uh, rod being hooked onto uh, chunks of cement and used to help keep the building stable. Yes. These are some of the things that were found there, not a lot. 
So, I have an offer. I will not be doing any more work, unfortunately. If there is anyone who is willing to take over, I already have a site lined up. I have permission from the uh, owner of the site. I've already visited. I have aerial photos. I will show them how to get the aerial photos to go in and measure the sites, take the pictures of the sites, the 60-some people that I've worked with to get this work done. Now, I will work with them from January to June. And if that isn't enough, I'll give them a free metal detector so they can start out. <laughs> but you got to get your own camera, your own <laughs> shovel, and your own gloves. Uh, I really, really hope that someone will go on from here. There's so much that's being lost. It's absolutely terrible, uh, but I just can't do it anymore. Uh, but thank you very much. You folks, take care. Uh, let's see. We had a little surprise for you. Uh, um, uh, Brent is going to pass around tickets. Yeah, we're at. You don't have to pay money. We don't want any money. It's just a free drawing. Uh, <laughs>